up will be posted uh, on the, and I'll distribute that link when we're done. Right, so that's going. How's my audio, by the way? Perfect. Also, your very nice sign in the back. Oh, making thanks. my heart smile. You know, it's the that's lovely, the decor that the wife puts up in the house is always wonderful. It is, uh, it's important. So I'm on the opposite end of the spectrum. If you could see this over my shoulder here, the mask on the wall. <laughs> the red nose, Love that, it. That's, that's a plague mask. That I fits, love it. It goes appropriate for today. <laughs> right. It's just, you know, I don't, I don't mean to be negative, but uh, it's, it oh, is where we are. Hysterical. Yeah. All right. All right. Um, so welcome everyone to um, the fifth in a series of uh, TransTech Boulder, TransTech Colorado uh, webinars, all webinars so far, but you know, we try to stay optimistic that we get to meet face to face someday. Um, we had over 50 people uh, register for this call. It, it, everybody doesn't always show up, but um, clearly a big interest in what I think is an all-star panel of speakers. So I think we're in for a treat today. So welcome to all, all of you. Um, for those, there might be a few that are still new to TransTech. Um, here's the, the kind of, in a nutshell, we're a global community of um, entrepreneurs, innovators, investors, building tech uh, on, on behalf of mental wellness, emotional well-being, and human flourishing. So there's quite a wide ambit of technologies and um, applications of those techs uh, in, in the world of uh, making the world a little bit of a better place. So uh, welcome to those of you who are brand new. And then um, one piece of news from this chapter, the TransTech Colorado chapter, is that um, we're in the planning stages for uh, what's called the TransTech Academy. So this is the global TransTech organization puts on an annual uh, accelerator program for startups, probably early stage companies as well, and, and, and even people who are thinking about um, becoming entrepreneurs and starting something up. So. Um, that uh, has not been announced for formally for applications, but um, uh, usually happens in September. It will happen in September. It'll start in September, be a six week program. So um, we'll be seeking uh, companies in the Colorado uh, area that are interested or even companies with Colorado links. Um, they will participate directly in the accelerator, um, but then we will have a local group of uh, advisors and mentors to help support that group as they work through that program. So uh, I'm pretty excited about that piece. So if you are, or if you know uh, a startup in the area and uh, you think might be interested, please put them in touch with me. There's my email there. Um, I will, once I take my slides down, put that email in the, uh, in the chat window so people can reach me that way as well. So that's the one housekeeping um, upcoming uh, very quickly. In fact, a week from now, uh, we, we are lucky enough to have uh, Dr. Jacqueline Stevens be available um, from CSU, who's done a lot of work with technology around uh, brain injury assessment and treatment. Uh, she'll talk about that, uh, her work, plus her what, what is a new focus for her, which is virtual reality as applied to uh, brain injury treatment. So that's, that's going to be a great one. Uh, so next, next Wednesday at the same time. And then uh, we, we'll do one more thing in July, and I call it the happy hour check-in and hangout. Um, drinks are optional, but welcome. And um, this one is more of a really intended for the Colorado audience. Um, and uh, hope that folks can come in and, and, and share with each other, you know, how we're doing. Um, and people get a chance to talk about what projects they have going in the trans tech space and why they're interested in the space. So um, I hope folks can join there. Uh, that Zoom dial-in is actually the live dial-in. I will send an invitation out by email shortly, but um, people can, uh, if they want to copy that link, can, uh, can join as well. And then we'll take uh, actually the month of August out. So that'll be sort of seven events that we've had so far this year, and uh, we'll take August off. Um, I don't know if anybody's actually going anywhere on vacation or if they're just going to make staycation, but, uh, but we'll give people time off for that. And uh, with that, let's get started with our uh, presentation. So here are our featured speakers. Uh, you should see all their videos live here. We have Paul Sorbo, president and COO of Wavi Medical. We have 
Subhash Padmanabhan, uh, who's a research engineer at Interex Interexon, sometimes known as the, the home of the Muse headset. And Chuck Anderson, who's a professor of computer science at CSU and, uh, and an entrepreneur in his own right. And so um, I won't read these and uh, let each of you, if you want to do a quick intro of kind of where you're coming from, but I'll post again all these uh, bios in the, uh, in the chat feed as well. So we don't have to take too much time there. So with that, uh, Paul, I'm gonna come off of share. If you wanna go ahead and get your... Yeah, let me get this all pulled up. All right, hopefully everyone can hear me. Don, are we good to go? Don, can you hear me? Yeah, I'm assuming we can. Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, perfect. Um, all right, so um, again, my name is Paul Sorbo. Um, I'm with Wabi. Um, Wabi, I, I guess a little bit about me. Um, I'm a uh, human optimist by trade, for lack of a better term. Uh, started with uh, the sports nutrition industry, uh, more in the, uh, you know, supplements and uh, performance end of things. Um, ended up wanting to go to medical school, got in um, to Hopkins, stayed there for about six months while I had some other businesses taking off, decided to pursue those businesses. Um, on the side of both growing them across the United States and globally. I still own those sports nutrition companies to this day. And then I got exposed to Wavi about two, two and a half, three years ago. Um, Wavi in itself um, is amazing, A, but B is, is really trying to pave the way for personalized medicine. Uh, it was started about 10 years ago by two men by the name of David Oakley and David Joffe, which I'll get into a little bit more uh, in the future. Um, but I've put together a couple of slides just with some general background information. And I'll go a little bit more in depth to each one of these things as we talk about them. Um, so Wawi by itself, who are we? Um, David Oakley and David Joffe are the two co-founders. Um, David Oakley, Nobel winning physicist or collaborating physicist um, a number of different times. Um, he actually helped uh, pioneer the hypodermic needle, him and his father as well, been in the medical space a while. Uh, David Joffe helped invent both the pulse oximeter as well as Lexicor, um, which uh, was heavily involved in the neurofeedback side of things. Uh, Frank Palermo helped with the Yale Rehab um, Hospital and AC medical um, does a lot of work in transcranial stimulation um, and, and a huge background in TBI as well as Scott Siemens um, with Crocs um, the founder you know one of the things that you know we look at in the medical market right now or the performance market as I am I am the president of performance um, is that there is a there, there's a shift happening and right now unfortunately, we are seeing unprecedented amounts of dementia and Alzheimer's. In the next 20 years, a lot of experts believe that one in two people, you know, at the, at the best, one in three people um, are going to be affected by um, some sort of cognitive decline disease. Um, that's a big issue. Um, if you look at, you know, obesity rates, we're above 60% as a population in the United States of morbidly obese. You know, childhood obesity is the highest it's ever been. Type 2 diabetes is the highest it's ever been since the inception of the disease. Um, you know, and mental health. And all of these things are coming to a culmination right now. And unfortunately, before now, there's never been a really quick, simple way to measure any of these types of things. You know, you can go get a spec scan, we can do fMRIs, we can look at DTI, we can look at white matter tracking, we can look at any one of those things, but are you really going to expose your patients to that on a year over year basis? It's just A, not affordable, B, it's not very much so accessible. I don't know very many people that have a you know extra five to ten thousand dollars that they can just throw out there. Um, you know, there are, uh, this is kind of the same stuff that we just went over. Um, you know, but you have 500,000 wellness practitioners and coaches um, that are really looking at this optimizing brain performance with, that just don't have access to brain tools that are fully objective. And that's really where Wabi's trying to solve this need. 
Um, Wavi by itself uses, it doesn't use anything new. Um, we use EEG and ERP, which is evoke potentials. Um, both have, of which have been around for about 70 years. Um, and there's amazing science on it. The problem with both of those things is that they've never been overly accessible. Um, so the same thing that we do in, you know, four minutes nowadays, uh, used to take you a, you know, a couple hours for five to $10,000. And, and we can do that same thing in literally four to 10 minutes. Um, a lot of people aren't very familiar with evoke potentials. So I'll kind of go over a small kind of introduction. So if I snap my fingers, your brain processes that with basically what we call a battery of your brain. So it has a speed at which it processes it, and it has an energy at which it processes any sort of sensory signal. That is actually what an evoke potential is. And we're able to measure how well your brain is processing any sort of sensory input. Um, we can do this both visually and we can do it auditory based as well. Um, it's an amazing marker because it really shows us, you know, cognitive resources, how well your brain is actually performing. And if we can establish a baseline for everyone, we can then kind of track subsequent scans, whether this is year over year, whether it's pre post intervention, whether it's, you know, pre post concussion research, um, you name it. Uh, we really, really are able to strive. And the best part about this is it's an extremely objective marker. Um, no longer, you don't, you don't have to worry about saying, you know, oh, I, I think I'm, I'm slowing. You know, and that's the big issue right now with, with the brain in, in particular is that, you know, let's say Susan comes in for her assessment. She's 25 years old. Yeah, you know, we don't have to worry about, you know, brain issues at that time. You know, she's 35. I still feel great, doc. 45, you know, I feel like I'm slowing a little bit, but I feel good. 55, I keep forgetting my keys. You know, all of these are subjective markers. We've never had an objective marker. Now, all of a sudden, if we can take Susan, we can say, hey, you know, here's the base on it, 25, 26, 27, all the way through 50. Let's maintain your cognition, if not be able to improve it. And if we ever see a downtick, we're not continuing 20 years with that downtick. And that's the whole key behind this. Um, we're doing a lot of work in a number of different areas. We're working in areas of mental wellness, depression, anxiety markers, concussive markers. We've done a six-year concussion study with a, a Division I NCAA team. Uh, a lot of research on cognition, et cetera. I'm really excited to see where we're going to continue to grow to. Um, the Wabi headset by itself is, is quite an engineering feat, if I'm being 100% honest. I don't know how many people on the call are going to be overly familiar with the traditional saline caps. Um, but you know, this is the furthest thing from, we don't actually have to use any sort of EEG gel at all. Um, it makes us able to do a full FDA medical, uh, class two device EEG scan in literally four minutes. Um, and that's just amazing. And, and again, if anyone's used to traditional EEG, it's, it's very far from that. Um, and they're cool colors. Hence Momo Design, um, Scott Siemens, if anyone's looking at that, very familiar to the Crocs-like uh, material, fully antimicrobial as well. Um, like I said, FDA approved. Um, the big thing that's really important to us is, is making sure that we are able to make this data really, really accessible to people. Brain data by itself can be really, really intimidating by itself. And, and one thing that we really, really wanted to take pride on was making sure that people felt as though that they could take action over this data and understand it. You know, you send someone home with a blood panel, it, it's all of a sudden, it's like, you know, that goes in the top drawer and it's never looked at again. We wanted this to be very friendly. We break it down into simple metrics. What's your brain reaction voltage? What's your brain reaction time? What's your physical reaction? We can get uh, you know, multiple session comparisons, jog neck tension, a measure of frontal alpha balance for things like depression and anxiety stress. And we did just add stuff like heart rate variability to the system, looking at both chronic and acute stress markers. Um, every one of these things on this report is fully actionable and can be changed. Um, and it just takes work. So we can track interventions, we can track lifestyle changes, we can see day-to-day -day changes or year-to-year -year changes. Um, and we're really excited about being able to provide the world with this. Um, that's about it as far as Wavi. These are pretty simple, just going over the uh, patent pending side of things um, and, and all the patents that we do have. Um, but that, uh, that is Wavi in a nutshell. Don, is there anything else that you would like me to cover on, on the side of Wabi, you know, with the data analytics and, and maybe the back end side? I don't want to run over too much time. 
Um, let's see where the, the questioning goes. So folks who have questions, I've, I've got everybody on mute, I think. Um, but if you have a question, please type it in the chat window. Um, so I think I told you, so I was introduced to you, Paul, by um, Pierre Brunswick, who's a yep. family practice doctor in Boulder here, and he uses your Wabi. Can you talk about that model? Because you don't, I think you don't sell this, the headset as a retail proposition, right? You deal with practitioners. Yeah, mostly we do have a performance side for biohacking clinics. We have we have a couple different entities of Wabi. We have a performance side, a medical side, as well as a research side. And all of that has to do with business classification, FDA regulations as well. Um, are you doing insurance reimbursement? Do you have a licensed practitioner in your clinic? And and all that's the back end side of Wabi or the back end side of business operations to make sure that you're being, you know, the right code of ethics in the right way so that the FDA doesn't shut you down. Um, but yes, Pierre Brunchwig, we do typically work with um, practitioners. Practitioners, and practitioners such as that, helping them a provide uh, uh, information to their patients that they've never before had access to. Pierre is really great at establishing a baseline examination for patients and doing year over year, every six month scans, and or looking at it and, and seeing what he can do to improve their brain performance. And that's the key. Um, what are the interventions? What's the diet? What's the exercise? What are the possible IV therapies or the, you know, he's huge on infusion therapies and peptides. Um, what can we do to actually boost these cognitive resources and see what we can do? And now we have a way to validate that. Very cool. Thanks. Um, one, I don't see any other questions from the audience yet. Um, one follow-up on that is uh, I know Pierre does, has done work on the cognitive decline piece and he's yep. very, uh, very happy with the performance. Um, it is such a widespread and well-known problem. Um, out of your, all the practitioners that actually work with you, do many of them, most of them do stuff with Alzheimer's or other cognitive decline, or is it not a big? It's rough, getting rough bigger. Uh -huh. I mean, it's getting bigger. It's, it's, I think the hard part is there's so much unknown in that area before now. Um, what is, what is Alzheimer's? What is dementia? What is a concussion, right? So like if you define any one of those things, you know, we really haven't had a way to actually measure these things. The problem with measurement up until now is it's all been subjective, right? We don't, we, it's, I don't feel good or it's different or it, it's just not, you know, what it used to be. Well, now we have objective markers and now we can actually affordably do that. So if we can measure Alzheimer's through its progression, instead of when its onset is actually there, what can we learn about it? Mm -hmm. Are there markers in the brain that do change? And, and there is a whole back end side of Wabi that is data analytics and, and fully anonymous data where we're able to create basically archetypes uh, to hopefully, you know, help identify uh, what is Alzheimer's? What does a dementia brain? What are these markers? Um, you know, what is, is there a marker for PTSD? It, you know, we just finished our NIH grant for the first objective markers of pain, uh, both chronic and acute. So, and that gets much more into the weeds of Wabi. It's, it's much less simple. You know, we're looking at state dependency, QEG, coherence, uh, really a lot more of that in-depth side of things. But then there's mm -hmm. also the other side of things that we really want this usable data that is 100% actionable for just yeah. the patients and the practitioners. Gotcha. Okay. Um, two questions on the on the panel. Let's see. Um, I'll ask one, but I'll um, ask uh, Subhash to go ahead and pull your slides up to get ready. But the last question for you, Paul, is um, from me here. Um, is, I think he's asking: is, is there a function within in the headset to give some kind of either feedback, real time feedback for the user, or even uh, modulation stimulation? Is, it, is that part? Yeah. Of so. It? We, we can't actually do any interventional tracking. So it's not like I can actually do neurofeedback tracking as far as, you know, measurement and uh, as far as being able to provide anything else as far as an intervention, transcranial stimulation, you know, neurofeedback. But mm -hmm. what we can do is we can do pre-post. The other thing that we do collect is we collect a full four minutes. We have the ability to collect up to 20 minutes of raw EEG data during any one of these scans. Um, so if anything is happening during those four minutes, um, as long as, or 20 minutes, as long as the patient isn't moving, or per person is not moving, uh, we are able to get that raw EEG data that can either be auto artifacted or manually artifacted, depending on the practitioner that we're working with. Great. Okay, thanks for that. Thanks, Paul. Great presentation. Stay tuned for some of the Q&A. So we have another question from Michael. I'm going to postpone this one because Subash is, is a perfect segue to Subash because uh, the question is about uh, using these devices for meditation. And so, Subash, your slides are up. Why don't you go ahead? Welcome. Awesome. Thank you. 
but thanks for having me on the panel don i really appreciate it um a little bit of background about myself got my phd in biomedical engineering and for my phd i developed machine learning algorithms for neuroprosthetic applications um, then i went on to do a postdoctoral fellowship at northwell health a hospital chain in new york got to work on more machine learning and data science techniques for a larger clinical and biomedical applications then i've been with interaxon since 2018 i'm a research engineer i develop machine learning algorithms build some cloud infrastructure for for some of the back end applications that run our system so just to start it off um i guess given the audience for this uh, webinar we all know what a bci is but the first thing that pops into anyone any average person's mind is a bionic arm uh, they want a communication prosthesis and there's a difference between like invasive and non invasive technology there's advantages and disadvantages to both so in terms of invasive technology you're talking about a microelectrode array that can actually like read like from a single neuron or a group of neurons and that gives you like a different set of applications you can develop from this um in terms of non invasive technology you're looking at more global averages of brain activity and then you can develop like applications based on that so with an invasive technology you have like very low spatial resolution you're looking at a small area of the brain and you have like really high temporal resolution by that i mean like you're sampling at like 30 kilohertz or like more which means like you can in infer like more uh, faster reactions from the brain um but there's like the surgical risks and hazards that you have to go through and non invasive brain sensing um uh, is you know that 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 was my uh, attraction to go here and you know interaxon is a consumer application so you buy our hardware you get an app and we provide bio signal feedback for health and wellness applications some of the things that we are excited about and what makes us um really like stand out in the market is our scalability the usability and the form factor and not to mention the cost of the device itself so like you can buy this device and be started out as like providing meditation feedback and we like that's our core product and we've uh, innovated on that so evolution of the form factor from what we started off with we launched news original in 2016 so that had eeg sensing technology it's a sparse electrode and you you get feedback for mind based meditation which means it was reading your brain waves and it was telling you what state you were in so the objective of meditation is to be calm and like be mindful of where you are in space then it will tell you based on your auditory feedback like if you are if your mind is wandering and how you can be mindful of that in 2018 we launched muse 2 um that was an addition of uh, a new sensor a ppg a photoplethysmography sensor so in addition to measuring your brain waves we were also looking at a proxy of your cardiac system so we were looking at heart rate we were looking at heart rate variability to give you feedback so and also it had an accelerometer so it gave you feedback about how much you're moving so depending on your meditation practice then you can you can um, learn and like better your own practice we've launched muse s in january 2020 it's a soft form factor and it's it's great it's very comfortable you can do everything you can um, all the applications developed for the original and the muse 2 you can use it for that but we're also really excited about the go to sleep meditations that we can do right now so in terms of usage of the device and usage of the application itself we saw people would usually meditate like in the morning or in the evening and given the time that we're going through right now with increased levels of anxiety and stress a lot of people have trouble falling asleep and muse is going to give them feedback and you wear the muse it tells you how you know tense you are how uh, anxious and mind how much your mind is wandering um people have different go to sleep routines um you might want to listen to a podcast you might want to listen to some uh, music or like a, a go to sleep bedtime stories uh, so we're really excited about the possibilities in that space as a health and wellness application we provide like the the core application is providing auditory feedback using multimodal signals and we are also now like in the space of providing like like in this exciting space of uh, go to sleep meditations so that's also pretty interesting for us in terms of the product evolution we are very centered around uh, developing some big data applications for customer engagement what that means is when we when we are working in the space of like a consumer app Uh, you want to be very mindful of what your customers want take them through the journey of like the product evolution with you and have like a iterative cycle for product development 
um, at this point, like our focus is on um, customer engagement and community involvement. We know that like you can do like we've we've seen like time and again like people use our use device for research purposes outside of the context of the consumer app, and we know that in our consumer segment like people have asked for more um, detailed metrics because um, people are interested in knowing like what what they want and what's going on in their mind and what's going on in their uh, cardiac uh, system when they're meditating or when they're like trying to fall asleep. So we're, we're looking forward to launching something in the near future that involves like um, an iterative process to develop some of these more advanced metrics. And um, yeah, stay tuned to it. We also do support like external researchers. And if you go to our website, we have like 200 plus publications. And I just wanted to talk about a couple of external research that I'm most fond of and like it's it's it sets the stage for what what is possible with a, a sparse eeg system the first paper here it actually goes through um, th this was done the, the study was con done entirely in mayo clinic uh, and then they used meditation as a therapeutic to treat secondary outcomes for breast cancer survivors and they found that using the muse people with cancer who used the muse had like more positive outcomes in terms of the stress and quality of life and fatigue. So that speaks to how much uh, it matters. And like we are, I'm, I'm personally like super uh, grateful that I get to work in a company where we're able to do these things and move people's lives this way. The other paper is looking at, it's more on the data analytics side, which means um, we, we have a portable EEG system and coming from a traditional academic background, like it was always difficult to run experiments. If I could run an experiment on like 50 people, that was awesome. But the scale at which we're talking about right now and the accessibility is just is, is in a different like magnitude. So we collected the authors of the paper collected uh, data from 6,000 subjects, and um, this is possible because if you have a uh, you have a telemetric device, essentially you can send it to people. You can you can increase the geographical scope of where you can recruit your participants right now, and that's super important given like in the post-COVID days we're living in. And what they found was they looked at population level dynamics um, of like neuro, neuroscience markers in a huge population. What they found was there was clear patterns in the, the, the different like frequency bands. And one of the important metrics that stands out is the alpha center frequency decreases with age. And alpha center frequency in literature is supposed to correspond to your level of attentiveness and um, how much like and yeah, your level of attentiveness is basically a proxy for how well you're meditating also, right? And that just means we, we have a potential biomarker, if you will, for um, getting a proxy of someone's age in terms of looking at their alpha center frequency. So upcoming features in our product roadmap, as you can imagine, we have go to sleep meditations and we wanna expand on that. And we feel that in this moment, like people use the device in their vulnerable moments when they actually want to fall asleep. And we want to help people actually have a better stress-free life, stress life. And with the initial meditation offering, people were already doing that when they were awake. And now we want to actually make them fall asleep more efficiently, more effectively, so that um, you, know, you wake up more refreshed. So it's like dealing with both sides of the coin so that you come up uh, refreshed and have a positive, healthy lifestyle. So we're working on like all of the applications and the product development for sleep tracking and those products and features will be released in the, in the near future. Uh, that's all I have for the presentation itself. So I'm happy to answer any questions. Great, thanks Subhash, that's great stuff. Um, there was one question about meditation. So you started addressing that, but I wanted to uh, bring up another point about um, Interaxon. So the company itself is based in Toronto uh, Subhash happens to be visiting Denver, so it's a happy coincidence. But um, but also, um, I was introduced to you by Sid Krauss, who um, was the co-founder of a, a company called Meditation Studio, which had a series of guided guided meditation applications that were available. And so now she is, I forget, chief marketing officer, maybe for, uh, for the, or president for the company. But um, so the meditation piece, uh, circle back. That's where you. That's where Muse started. But uh, clearly, you've got a lot of other things kind of going. But um, in terms of meditation practice, is there feedback from your user community about the effectiveness, and do you kind of track that, or how does that work? So that's a that's a great question. So first of all, 
uh, if you just look at meditation in general without like biosignal feedback there's different schools of thoughts on what actual meditation practices are and they have like different meditation styles and there are different paradigms that you can follow with meditation so the act of measuring meditation in and of itself is kind of counterintuitive to like you being in the moment and experiencing the experiencing the meditation itself right so it makes it makes it harder and it's difficult to come up with good controls of what it means to have a good meditation practice and it's definitely not something that's that's going to happen in like one session or two sessions if we were to get like very uh, theoretical about it it's a it's a journey it's a process and people we have like large groups of like a huge segment of our population we call them super users and they have like they 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 do like 1000 plus sessions um you know like for 3 years they've been doing like meditation sessions and they they won't stop because they they see the benefit in that and um to that 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 kind of like wraps up like how to evaluate the efficacy of meditation is based on your lifestyle and what you seek out of this and this is just one part of having a healthy um, health and addressing health and well-being so there's like other aspects of your life how how stressed you are about your work and on all of that so it goes in conjunction with it cool okay thanks um so we'll move next to Chuck. If you want to Chuck, I want to load your, well, actually don't load yet. I'm sorry. I had one more question for Zubash, which is I'm a user. I've, I've had a Muse headset for, if you can see that. Uh, yep. It's one of the uh, Muse tools, I think. And um, I've been very excited about it. But uh, I think a question I have on both for you actually and Paul is, you know, the, I don't know if you'll be able to see this, but you can see sort of the sensors on here. Mm -hmm. So a smaller number of sensors compared to a skull cap kind of a device. So how do you, where is, is there sort of a sweet spot of how much coverage you get and what kind of data you get compared to, you know, full medical grade, you know, in the hospital EEG? So I can answer the question just around uh, Muse. Uh, that's the original Muse. And um, it's, it's comparable in terms of, so we, like, I don't have that paper right now, but uh, people have evaluated. So the gold standard for a, uh, clinical grade eeg system is the ability to measure erps which paul was talking about and we've had papers um, published by external researchers that show that you can actually get erps with a muse and they've compared it to clinical grade eeg systems the reason we resorted to using a sparse system was that's enough information to give you auditory feedback for the application we develop you don't need a whole skull cap to do what we're doing uh, that is not to say um, you know, you can actually like get good uh, readings from our device. I, I think oh, quick. just to ca yeah, caveat off that, I think it all depends on, um, you know, what you're trying to accomplish with the EEG, right? So if you're looking at meditation or at home use, I mean, the Muse is absolutely phenomenal, right? I have one. I've been a I've been a user my for years at this point, right? I also have I have every brain tech you can imagine, right? Um, when it comes to Wavi, if you're trying to do a full you know evaluation of ERPs, let's say on a 20 lead or, or a 19 lead EEG, you know it, it's going to be good enough or it's going to be great comparatively speaking to what most people have. If you're doing a 24 hour you know seizure study, you're never going to use a Wavi cap. You need 144 lead EEG medical grade that you can literally have with saline, you know, and an EEG that you're literally hooked up to for 24 hours. And a lot of it's just going to be the basically spatial proximity that we're able to actually track the actual evaluation of the cortex. Um, and, that, and that's really where we're looking at. EEG spatially is, is good on the cortex. Anything below you know, cortical stimulation is fairly hard to read with the EEG, but I think it all boils down to what we're actually attempting to measure in the use yeah. case, if you would agree with that. <clears throat> yeah, that, yeah, absolutely. Like, again, your measuring device is like one part of the application you're developing and like it's like the fundamental part of it. So you start off with like a good measuring device and you also have like, what can you extract from the signals you um, actually like record? So like for something like a seizure detection, absolutely. Like you need like more uh, spatial resolution to kind of track that. And absolutely. with respect to the Muse device itself for your meditation practice for either like during the day or like go to sleep meditations, I think it's uh, com it's actually comparable to a medical grade device, even though it has lesser channels. Yeah. Okay. Great, thanks both for that. Um, okay, Chuck, do you wanna go ahead and roll up your? 
slides? Sure. Let's see. Um, Hmm, that's not working. Can we see, yeah, just not, not in presentation mode. Do you see my first slide? No. We, we see the slide, but not, not in presentation mode. Right. So let's see. Get out of that. Sorry, I'll get there in a sec. How does that look? Perfect. Okay, great. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, so um, I'm going to try to address some of those questions too about number of electrodes we need for different applications, but. Uh, and I'd go through a few slides with you first. Um, so my name is Chuck Anderson. I'm in the Department of Computer Science at Colorado State University. I've been there for almost 30 years now. And I've also founded this um, small company, mostly consulting company called Pattern Exploration. I'll say a little bit more about it a little, a little later. I've uh, been doing machine learning research for you know, close to 40 years. I've been teaching it and doing it at CSU. A lot of our brain computer interface work started back in the 90s and has been supported by the National Science Foundation all along. So I'm going to review um, some of what we've done. I'm going to give you a little introduction to EEG and some processing information in case any of you are not too familiar with it. And then we'll get into some of the future issues. So brainwaves, what are brainwaves? Well, I think you all know our brains composed of lots of individual cells called neurons, interact electrically and chemically. And you probably also know you can't, we can't measure the activity of one neuron from the scalp, which is why there's lots of work on implanted electrodes. There's lots of, a number of companies trying to do invasive recording. And of course, a lot of animal experiments to figure out what's going on in the brain by recording from individual cells. But we can't measure that at the scalp. What we can get at the scalp is um, shown by this bottom diagram. You can place a little metal disc, which is an EEG electrode on top of your head. And if enough neurons underneath that electrode are kind of synchronized in electrical activity, we're firing patterns, then we can get a weak electrical potential on the scalp, but it is weak, 10 to 50 microvolts or so, which is about the amplitude you get if you raise your hand up in the air and, and receive a radio station in your body. So it's pretty hard to tease that apart from other um, signals, although recent EEG instrumentation amps have been able to do that, as you probably heard from these the previous two speakers. Um, EEG at different scalp locations, it is fairly, um, uh, not a lot of spatial resolution with conventional EEG electrodes. Typically people use these 1020 system of electrode placements, although you saw, um, you have seen examples, Paul and Subhash also showed you EEG electrode caps, maybe at different uh, locations and the band, the Muse band doesn't go all through this level, but the clinical standard is this 1020 system, 10 degrees between the electrodes left to right and 20 degrees front to back. The EEG voltages don't change a lot across spatial locations as this little color animation shows, but this, like I said, is conventional EEG electrodes and I'm gonna talk more about that spatial resolution in a minute. One second of EEG looks a lot like this little graph on the top right. So a little bit of the history. Yes, it's been around a long time, like Subhash mentioned, um, or maybe it was Paul, sorry. Back in the 1920s, Hans Berger was the first person who really tried to record EEG from humans by modifying an old radio amplifier to try to get these signals. And he was actually characterizing different frequencies. He was the first one to identify those alpha frequencies that Subhash mentioned. So we've known about this for a long time. And a lot of the EEG electro technology is still um, like what Berger developed, just a metal disc, although the electronics, of course, are much more advanced. Um, present BCI applications, and this is where my experience has been, not so much in um, mental well-being or meditation. It's more attempt to get brain-computer interfaces developed where a person can actually control the device. 
And I wanted to just mention these three types of applications that have been around for a number of years that are based on what we know about the brain. Um, the first one is this expected stimulus causes a change within one second. Sometimes that's called the P300, which is just a positive wave, 300 milliseconds after the stimulus. So if you're watching letters flash on a screen, you see the one you want, you may get this kind of aha signal. And we can detect that with enough repetitions and decide which um, letter you want to type. The second form is that we know about the brain is if you have flickering images at a certain frequency that you're looking at, we can find similar um, frequencies in your EEG recorded from the back of your head in your visual cortex area. That's referred to as a steady state visual evoke potential. And movements, real or even imagined movements of your arms or legs can cause, will cause changes in the amount of EEG in certain frequencies over your motor cortex, which is a central area kind of like have, if you have a headband, hairband over your head is kind of that strip up left and right side. Sometimes these are referred to as motor related potentials or event related synchronization. So these are things we've known about the brain and this is what has driven most of the BCI development. This is an example of using the P300 signal for a typing application. Um, this is called the P300 speller and if you search YouTube for P300 speller, you'll see a lot of examples of this. Uh, and if you wanted to type the letter S, let's say you're looking at the letter S whenever that S lights up, we'll get that P300 signal. Although you have to average over a lot of trials to get an accurate determination of that, which is why this keeps flashing. If I waited a little bit longer, you'd see an S typed at the top of that screen. Um, the second thing I said about flashing images at certain rates have been the basis of some video games where this one on the left is, a, is a, um, some kind of creature trying to walk across a tightrope line. And if you stare at the flashing checkerboard on the left, the creature will tilt left or, or on the right will tilt right. Or you can have four of them to guide a race car around a track. And again, this application has been around for a while and is even used to select links in, in web pages to help you navigate a page if you can't. Again, this is for people who maybe have lost a lot of the voluntary muscle control. They can't move their hands or fingers, but they can look at the screen. So it's completely passive, except they are looking at different parts of the screen. Eventually with neurodegenerative diseases, people can lose that ability to even control their gaze, even though their autonomic system continues to function. Um, so ultimately that's the type of uh, person that we might be trying to focus some of these applications on. And then imagining movements. Uh, this is an example of another typing application where a person is imagining, I believe in this case is maybe moving a right hand versus a left hand to move a cursor up and down to select different parts of the alphabet to type. And this worked pretty well for this person. Although mistakes can be made, so you need a delete key like that backup. So those are the three forms of uh, responses a brain has that we know about. In our lab for years, we've been focusing on uh, sort of more obtuse areas of the brain or, not, or <laughs> things we don't understand about the brain. Uh, we've been using off-the-shelf EEG amplifiers. Our custom software is our current contributions here. And we, we're recording from multiple electrodes. Um, like was just said a minute ago, more electrodes are needed to get a more accurate understanding of what's going on in lots of areas of your brain. And we are trying to determine which of several mental tasks that are easy to repeat that a person is performing. Like imagine a favorite song or do some math, mathematical exercises in order to control devices. And the neuroscientists can't tell us what your brain is doing during those tasks. So instead, we record a lot of data from people doing these different tasks and use machine learning methods to statistically find the differences between the patterns in order to detect them in the future. This can lead to really interesting hypotheses about how your brain does cognition. Um, that's coming into the future, though. Um, We've spent some time taking our systems out into people's homes and recording from them, from people with motor impairments. This is a picture of a collaborator, Patty Davies, at an occupational therapy department at CSU, helping us record from a patient who had a high level spinal cord injury. And this is an example of some of the software we've developed. We have this kind of pie menu or ring menu where a person imagines a song or their leg moving or counting backwards. And each time that is detected, this center, center bar extends out to that region. And as soon as you have enough repetitions, that particular task is selected. And on the left, you see a person who's in a wheelchair again who was using this in a conference we went to recently to select a certain piece of music to play. 
once he selected it, he got a, lot, a round of applause for playing the music. Um, so the future. I don't know how many of you are old enough to remember The Matrix, but The Matrix is, of course, a movie where people had implanted electrodes and did amazing things with it. We're, of course, not there yet, but what does the future hold? Well, I think to make real advances in practical applications in all kinds of areas, we need new pattern discovery methods because we need to discover new indicators in the brain, like the other two speakers just talked about, that relate to mental health or mental activity or intense intentions that the person wants to have happen in a computer or a wheelchair, for example. And I strongly feel we need new sensing technologies, and I'll mention that in just a bit. So an example of new pattern analysis methods, um, here's an example that was developed by one of my past PhD students, Elliot Forney, who now works at IBM in Denver. He was modeling the dynamics of your brain with recurrent neural networks. And I don't have time to talk about neural networks here, but just let you know that this has a recurrent connection. So this little model actually has dynamics in it too. And this fun colorful slide, I just want to illustrate what it can do. The top graph shows um, in red is where the uh, frequency is a higher amplitude and on the vertical axis is frequency. So 10, 20, 30, 40 Hertz. If you look at the top, that's the actual EEG. There's lots of 10 Hertz, 12 Hertz in the alpha range that you can see. If Elliot modeled this data with a small neural network, uh, on the left of this vertical black bar is the predictions of the model given the current EEG, it predicts the next signal. F to the right of the black vertical bar, we disconnect the actual data and have the neural network model itself generate the signal. And you can see what has happened is it has locked on to the dominant frequency in that data. So it's, it's duplicating that 10 hertz, that alpha wave. So at least it's learned that. He went further and, and used a fairly large network and we could see that the network is now generating kind of chaotic signals, very much like real EEG. So in a way, it has, it has learned some of the dynamics of your brain. We can use that then to distinguish different mental tasks based on what frequency patterns there are. Um, I think I'm dwelling too much on some of this, so let me move on. New sensing technologies. Uh, you, you saw the previous two speakers talk about their own designs for EEG caps or, or headbands, which is really cool. There's there are significant breakthroughs being done there. Um, I wanted to tell you about this other kind of EEG electrode, though, which is focused on high spatial precision and high temporal precision technology. This was developed by Walter Basio at the University of Rhode Island recently. He calls it a tripolar concentric ring electrode. And he also provides a preamplifier that subtracts signals between the various rings to get a very spatially precise reading of what's going on underneath the brain, uh, underneath the electrode, sorry. This has been a problem because, as was said, when e e brain activity comes up through cerebral spinal um, fluid or the skull and the skin, it gets kind of spread out in time and in space, so it's hard to get an accurate reading. But Basio is showing he's getting almost as precise readings as you get from some of the implanted electrodes. He's done a lot of epilepsy work to show that. I used some of these electrodes recently just to compare the typical things we do in brain-computer interfaces. Um, in the middle here, you see his concentric ring electrode. Underneath that, we see a P300 signal that is blue, this positive signal about um, two to three tenths of a second after the stimulus, which happens on the left of this graph. On the letter you're looking at, we get the blue response. A letter you're not, if it's a letter that is not what you want, you get the red, so we can distinguish those pretty well. On the right is what you get in a conventional electrode. It's quite noisy, there's not as much difference between the two. And so we've shown that we can get a much more accurate indication of the P300 signal with his electrodes. We only need one or two trials instead of the 10 or 15 you have to average over normally. And with uh, finger movements, we see a real difference in the signals down the left side of the screen for the different electrodes down the left side of your, of your brain. You can see where they're located in the red marks. But the conventional electrodes just don't show much difference. This gives us, gives, gives us a hope that we can use his scalp electrodes, these new scalp electrodes, to actually distinguish individual finger movements to control prosthetic devices, which was believed to be not possible before even this year with conventional electrodes. So that's where we want to go, is to add this fine control of prosthetics without having to implant electrodes. Like I said, the implanted electrode industry has made great gains. They have some beautiful videos of people learning to control robot arms.
but there is, of course, a real danger to implanting those electrodes. So that's all I wanted to say. For more information, you can find our our BCI lab here at www.cscollegestate.edu slash eeg, and there's my email address. Um, my company is looking at all kinds of solutions that use AI and machine learning to solve real world, world problems involving um, life, health, and environment. And so we are working on some BCI application, but just here's a, some examples of the work we have been doing. And the website for our company is at patternexploration.com. So with that, I will be quiet and have any questions. It's on mute. Thanks, Chuck. Um, so we have about 10 minutes for questions. I wanted to actually, while we're waiting for questions, ask Paul and Subash both to just any quick reaction, especially to that last piece about the, the new sensor technology that uh, Chuck and others are working on. Comments there? I think, I think it's amazing. I mean, as he was talking about, I mean, above potentials, that's what we measure as a P300. And, and we're, you know, out of, out of being able to get data, we're still doing four, you know, uncommon tones or 40 uncommon tones. <clears throat> and, and to be able to get accurate evoke potentials in, in two to three trials is, is just astonishing and very excited about that technology. Mm -hmm. Great. Great. Uh, I, I think, I think that's awesome. Like a tripolar electrode. Um, it just like makes the signal so much more nicer and like especially with like repeated trials in an ERP experiment you don't want your signal to die like within your noise so mm -hmm. that looks awesome. The, the disadvantage this still has is it is you do, do need to put the conductive gel on each one of these electrodes and, and you have both found ways around that where you use saline or other things so that technology is in, is, is in its infancy and maybe he can develop a saline version at some point. <laughs> Collaboration. It's all this world needs to come to, you know, so we can all continue to push this forward. Right, right. Uh, I took everyone off mute on the, in the audience. If you want to unmute yourself, if you have a question. Anyone? Oh, there's um, Muniaki. Do you want to go ahead? Oh, hi. Uh, my name is Mune, uh, attending from Tokyo. And uh, I'm in the AI business. And I have a question uh, to everybody. And um, I'd like to know, I'm very new to BCI, and uh, I'd like to know whether BCI is effective for um, uh, learning disability, uh, learning dis disability people. Uh, one of the things I'm like researching is that um, how to prevent technological unemployment. And the people who are academic smart can learn new things and uh, very adapted to digital skills or digital knowledge. However, the people who are not good at learning or people who has the tendency of learning disability, I'm a bit worried about how they can adapt um, digital ages. And uh, I'm a very amateur of BCI, mm. so I'd like to know whether BCI is kind of effective for learning disability people or people who are not good at learning in the future. Thank you very much. Um, just a quick comment. Like I think there are like multiple companies doing this already, like in terms of uh, helping kids or like people with learning disabilities. There's also companies doing this from a medical perspective. There's um, people with stroke rehabilitation who have a video game they can play and they get feedback based on EEG. So I think that's already, um, if not like commercially available in the market, there's like active research going on. And just using EEG and like other biosignals in the loop uh, to help people learn better about their own um, uh, disabilities and like how they can quickly, not just learning, but like relearning in the sense of uh, stroke, right? So that's, that's actually going on right now. Yeah. Uh, okay, thank you, Subash. Uh, do you One of the area, oh, oh. go for it, sorry. Uh, I just want to know, uh, Subash, so do you have any recommendation for the service? I, I don't know the specifics of the companies, but like. Yeah, no, um, no, go I, ahead, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry. 
I think one of the important um, things about that is also the ability to measure and actually look at what the quantitative and qualitative data of each one of those learning disabilities is and right. create archetypes to actually be able to maybe look at, you know, it, it under archetype A, B, or C through AI learning, we're able to see that, you know, intervention X, Y, or Z is most effective in this circumstance. <clears throat> and I think that requires mass data co collection at, at, at affordable prices. Um, and that's something that that is obviously becoming more and more accessible. But, I, that, you know, that's one of the areas that we're doing a lot of background on is is creating those archetypes and trying to actually figure out, you know, what is, okay, stroke, concussion, <clears throat> and, and, and trying to define these things or, or learning disabilities, you know, Alzheimer's dementia, and actually tracking the interventional um, um, approach of those side of things as well. Mm -hmm. the, there, okay, thank you, Paul. What's up? Let's try to get one more question. Uh, Michael, you want to ask your question? You want to mute? In the chat window, I see Michael's question is, did I understand that the, uh, Professor Bessio, the TCRE, has some built-in processing? Yes. He um, actually brain product sells some of his electrodes with his uh, pre-amplifier that does a lot of this. Um, it's pretty much doing a surface Laplacian inside of his electronics due to the subtraction of the rings. And its output is at the level of a regular um, EEG electrode that can be then connected to any EEG amplifier on the market. So yes, he has his own electronics. And he's also in the midst of developing, starting to market other electronics that actually inject very weak currents with the same spatial precision to help some of the neural rehabilitation that Sebastian was talking about. And maybe someday in the future could help deal with uh, learning disabilities and rehabilitate people that way. I, that's way in the future, but <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, any last questions? Um, I wonder if I could just ask one as a sort of global thing. We, we've talked here, both talk about hardware and I think both Subhash and Paul about uh, software, you know, uh, applying AI or machine learning or you know, big data analytics to these fields. Where is, are, are we on sort of a Moore's law kind of curve here that these devices are good and the, and the software around them are going to get just exponentially better? <laughs> just, we won't hold you to it. I'll, I'll give you my quick reply. I think uh, Subhash and Paul and their companies are developing some really amazing uh, analysis methods. Over the years, I've come to feel like no matter how sophisticated my machine learning methods are, I'm limited by the data coming out of those little electrodes. So I think the sensing technology, once that gets beyond the current brick wall, everybody's going to be ready to do some amazing developments. All right. Just to caveat off that, I mean, you can look at EEG and, and you know, corically it's great, but you start going into, you know, the deeper areas of the brain and... Mm -hmm. You know, you can look at coherence network graphs and, and, and it's, a, it's an estimation, right? It's not actually looking at the, the, the connection between, you know, the frontal lobe and the occipital lobe. What is the communication that's happening? What are those pathways? You know, how is the brain actually performing and or registering cognition at any one of those things? And, and just to 100% agree with that, until we are able to, you know, sense those more deep cortical activities, I think it's going to be hard uh, to, to see a, a full progression, but, you know, hopefully we're on the way without having to drill into people's skulls. And I mean that in a nice way. <laughs> um, Subhash, I think there's, uh, yeah. Yeah. I think there's also the aspect of um, looking at biosignal proxies of other uh, systems in your body. For instance, you can look at PPG and you can add like this multimodal information. So you're not di directly looking at neural markers anymore, but they the, are still proxies. Um, there might be behavioral markers. You might attach a webcam to your BCI now that might give you like more information about emotions. You might not be able to go to the emotional center of the brain, but now you're looking at like the proxies. So all of that combined and with the power of um, the hardware and the software that still needs to go a long way. I think there's like boundless opportunities there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, and the interaction with the human is just amazing you guys are doing. A lot of the BCI research has not had that part. And we're losing out by not having the human more participatory in the feedback process. 
good deal. All right, thank you, Chuck. Thank you, Subash. Thank you, Paul. Uh, you know, I could have listened to each of you for an hour alone. So appreciate you doing the panel together. It's been, uh, it's just been hugely informative and entertaining. We, we thank you. And thanks, thanks to everybody. For, uh, thanks to everybody for joining thanks, the call today. Thanks. In the chat window, you'll see the next two events. Uh, if you want to go ahead and copy those links, I'll leave that up for a minute. Mm -hmm. But thanks everybody for joining. Thank you, Don. Bye -bye.